All right, the social and psychological impact. And I have a room for clinicians here, so I'm not gonna do all the talking. I'll just click, okay? Deployment. Like I said, we've been through a few deployments, and now it's ramping back up again. You know, um, like I said, um, we're, we're gonna have our 12th one this fall, so wish us luck. Um, but deployment comes in many phases, in three phases, right? We have the pre-deployment, the post, the during deployment, and the post deployment. And um, you know, if, if forgive me if I'm being redundant, if I'm telling you already what you know, but from a clinical and personal uh, experience, you know, the the post deployment, right? So you look at the service member. The service member is going to be focused about training, preparation, and planning, right? On the other side, there's going to be some feelings of maybe some, some fear, right? A little bit of anxiety. You don't know what the mission's about. With the service member and with the family too, some anxiety, some fear, resentment, anger towards a deploying parent and to the parent who's staying home because there's gonna be some new rules. There's gonna be some shift in dynamics, right? Either mom or dad or either one can, you know, will have to supplement the absence of the other, right? Deployment. My husband always says that he feels guilty because he's like, you know, I fly missions here every other day, right? I go to the gym, they feed me well, they do my laundry. You're at home working full-time job with, with two kids, you know? Some spouses who are left behind feel some resentment. You know, you get to do, you get to do all that stuff and here I am with very limited support. And you know, with, with military families, uh, they relocate, so they don't have grandma, grandpa, aunties, you know, tias, tios, down the street to help them out, to help them out. And with these younger families too, they don't know what resources are available to them on base or on post or even off post, right? They don't. Well, what, what I do is, and what I urge uh, my, uh, families that I work with is that if your spouse is deploying, let the teacher know. And I do that myself. I do that myself. By the way, you know, he's, he's gonna be leaving, this is the time, so expect some you know, behaviors for Madison and Zachary because they, they, they will react. Um, they will react. Um, Post-deployment, what does that look like? Transition, the focus is all about transition, right? Coming home, so that, that release you know, from all that tension from being high ops tempo for 12 months or for however long that person was deployed, right? Again, shifting in dynamics, right? The, the mom or dad who was left behind with the kiddos has established new rules, taking on a different role, and now it's time to renegotiate, right? With, with, with my kids, they always do the splitting towards the end, because daddy can't say no this first few weeks, and I'm the bad guy. <laughs> yeah. Can I have a Kit Kat for breakfast? No, 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 no. So, but, with that though, the, the, the phases, they have different implications with service member and to the family unit. And that's something that we cannot diminish or ignore. Um, you know, as, as part of that child's life, right? We have, it behooves us to make sure that we, we have the resources and the information um, that we have, you know, to access and share with them. All right, military moves, these are costly. I'm not just talking about money, I'm talking about time, attention, energy, right? You get your orders, six, three to six months later, you're expected to re uh, report, right? Report on a later than date, they give it to you, right? So uh, mom and dad, or mom, mom, dad, dad, you know, are focused on out processing, um, packing, and making sure that they're communicating to the receiving command some of the kids don't even want to move. And the older they get, they don't want to move. The younger ones are easier. It's like, new adventure, you know? Um, no more snow, that's why I was feeling, um, feeding them. But, you know, but like I said, it's, 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 it's a drain on the family's resources, right? And if the attention is focused on the move, then that limits the attention given to the child who needs it, who may be resistant to the move who may be feeling sad and lonely about leaving their friends behind, you know? Kids are very, we say kids are very resilient, they are. But they do, they do feel pain, they feel anxiety, they get nervous, right? They get scared. So it's, it's, 
the allocation of resources too that, that the parents have to really be, be cognizant about. And for us to um, offer support to those families who are undergoing that um, transition. Um, in the audience here, um, in your role, in your setting where you work at, how does this look like to you? Deployment and military moves with the kids that you work with. Yes, ma'am. Um, we have a lot more uh, compared to other bases like uh, Colleen, Fort Hood. Uh, we have a lot of uh, active duty members who are in training, they come for training, and then they transition to the next base, to PCS, to whatever mission that they're going to do. Um, we have a lot of kids that, um, like dad's at, dad or mom is in the military, and then they um, get done with their training. So a lot of, depending upon where they are in their training, and you think um, mom or dad may be at the barracks and not be able to have much contact with the family while they're in training, and they will have, um, and <coughs> so the other parent has to go and bring all the kids to go see them because there's a time where they're in training where they can't uh, leave the post, and it's pretty restricted for Part of the other thing I saw with uh, with deployment is that uh, the uh, active duty member will go to a lot of different classes, a lot of different scenarios, but the family may only meet once, have a, a round table meeting, and tell them what's going to go on. And then after that. If the training is in six months, then family is never ever included uh, in anything again. So the active duty members caught up on everything, boom, boom, boom. But the family is is there, but they're on the outside looking in because they had that one meeting. We'll get you some more information later, and, and that's it. Yes, they get a couple brochures, right? And then that's it. But guess what? The National Guard is really good about those yellow ribbon events, though. The, the post-deployment, the 30, 60, 90 days, and those are, those are great, great avenues for uh, families to get together and talk about their own transition and get some really lessons learned and you know, best practices as, how, as to how to integrate um, um, their service member and their family back into the family fold. I think the other thing with the, with the older kids is that uh, it's their acceptance to where they're going because they have their core friends and their routine, not so much their uh, uh, rebellious about the move and everything, but either I'm established here, my friends are here, and sure, it's a part of the unknown going to the next place, but we always want to be accepted, and we don't know if people are going to accept us, and so that's why that behavior comes out before the, the move takes place. Well, I work with elementary age kids, and with the PCSing, the thing that I hear, I'm just out in the general population a lot, is that they'll say, I'm going to move. And then, you know, we say, well, when are you leaving? And they're like, I'm not sure. Maybe the 20th, maybe next month. Mm -hmm. And so they're very, I, it sounds like the military doesn't give you a firm date. It's kind of a range. <laughs> 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 You're a three. You have a three six month range, right. you know. So I have most of my stuff is in totes. That feels really unstable because they don't know, and they're very attached to their school. But then another thing that we see that's interesting. It's not just they leave, but the kids that stay behind miss those kids, and they point to their spot at the lunch table. Like, right? you know, they tell me, hey. Zach moved yesterday. And, oh, I didn't need to say goodbye. And then we all talk about that spot at the table. So they have a, a sense of loss as their friends PCS away. And thank you for pointing that out. Thank you for pointing that out. Because, you know, those kids, they'll get left behind. And they experience a loss, like you said, too. Because it's also not a one-size-fits-all adjustment either. I mean, an introverted child might have a harder time adjusting than an extroverted child. And other factors that may be going in on in the family as well, whether there's trauma or emotional issues. You know, so it's not like a one size fits all effect on the way to keep 
Yeah. Right. Yes. Uh, you're definitely right. It, it varies from child to child, from family to family, and um, also the receiving community or command, you know, uh, and also the losing community and command, how well prepared they have the family set up. I saw a hand here. Yes, sir. Um, I was just thinking um, another, another thing I don't hear about too often nowadays because we've been involved in these, uh, in these wars, these long wars, where, you know, a lot of information has come out is... Um, when I first uh, went in, it was in the 80s, so we had a lot of like little wars back then. So uh, some of us were were putting our family through the um, like the overnight deployments where you just got called in, and next thing you know, you were in uh, Panama and places like that, mm -hmm. Grenada. And I remember I screwed up because uh, we we were in Panama, so I left my wife at uh, with my young son in California and it was winter time. So she was freezing. And back then, you know, we didn't have the electronic photos. So mm -hmm. I used to send her the, uh, like the disposable ones and she would get them developed in California. So for the longest time, she was really angry at me because she would see me down there just enjoying the sun. And, <laughs> no, and did I you have my thighs just... though with those pictures? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so she was over there freezing and I was down there, but she, and another thing she didn't realize was that the only time we took those pictures was when we were in between missions. Downtime. That so was your downtime. It looked like we were down there having a great time. Mm -hmm. But in her mind, she was thinking, man, this guy's down there in a, in a hot, mm -hmm. sunny place. Yeah. You know, with his shirt off and hanging mm -hmm. out with his buddies, taking funny pictures and smiling. And I'm over here with my kid and mm -hmm. freezing. Not North Dakota. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Why not my not? Why not my not? So, um, so that's also shocking too because when you come back you're thinking like all right you know i did a good job down there i made it back alive but then she's just angry at you and you never figure out why until mm -hmm. many years later when right. you talk about it mm -hmm. and yeah so that was it i was i was expecting like a hero's welcome yeah like a warm-up with a banner and everything <laughs> she was mad at me for a long time so. yes. and and transition and thank you for pointing that out you know it Sometimes that occurs within like a week, right? If we're lucky, not really. Month, years, like you said. Sometimes we don't talk because you know life gets in the way and you have to keep on moving. And sometimes we don't offer ourselves, we think it's a luxury to sit down, digest what happened, process it as a family and talk about it. We don't because life, life you know, throws all kinds of curveballs your way and you have to like deal with it. Just going back to the extrovert and introvert for mm -hmm. the kid population that I work, the young ones, and I'll hear, oh, well, they're doing fine. They haven't read. Uh, and they're like, what? I, I want to see a reaction. When they when there is no reaction, they're like, they, they shut. They're flat affect. They're flat. There's nothing there. And uh, one child that I'm working with, his uh, uh, grand, grandfather, who was his primary male uh, care, uh, figure and caregiver, got deployed. Mom then left mm -hmm. and then uh, so just left with grandma and aunt and they had a, a drill they had a weather weather drill or whatever it was and while all the other kids were uh, upset and you know wanting to be next to teacher this child had no response he just oh. shut down sat down and did nothing and the other teacher who I think is new to military life uh, there she was yeah, he was just so calm and I'm like that's no not that's not calm, calm. <laughs> Something to right, me. right. He shut down. He shut down completely. Yeah. And she goes, so you want? I go, it, but he's being aggressive. That's not aggressive. He is showing it in this way. But mm -hmm. he could be depressed. He could be scared. He could be frustrated. He could be anxious. I mean, all these other things. But we as adults see it as he's mad. Mm -hmm. He's being aggressive. He just kicked that whatever and mm -hmm. took the chair away. He's sad. Yeah. Imagine if you as an adult going through whatever it is. And we have all these great language capabilities to express it. Right. We don't. This is a child that none. Right. And we're going to fault. Mm -hmm. so. Yeah. Thank you. Um, and also, I, I, I hear, too, from you know, kids of all ages, like mostly middle school and high school kids, like, well, why make friends? We're only going to be here two years. Right? Like, I don't even want to enroll in, uh, in sports or drama club or a debate club because the clock's ticking. The second you're in process on post, the clock's ticking. Your time's, you know. And that's, 
that's hard to shut off. So I work with veterans and their family members, but the adults, so not so much the kiddos. Um, but it, that's a hard mindset to turn off. So they've been out of the military, some of them, for many years, and mm -hmm. they still don't connect to people in their community. Mm -hmm. And it's just like, well, I'm looking for the other veteran family or the other veteran. And it's like, but you're, if you move, it's your choice at this point in time. Mm -hmm. But that's hard to change when it's like, I'm so used to moving, why get connected to somebody mm -hmm. else? Right. No, you're absolutely right. Um, it's ingrained, especially if that's that's all they know. You know, you know, you know, our formative years that what shapes us as adults, and if that's what they experience the first five years of their life, then that's going to carry on, right? Whether it's a good or, or bad behavior, it's if not addressed, if not talked about, and it will continue on, and it will get passed on to the next generation as well too. If we're not careful. Here, and we talked about this, different impacts, right? Sleeping disorders, anxiety, declining grades, behaviors, because their communication skills are limited, depending on their age. So it comes out you know, in different things. They'd be kicking or being rude, etc. So it's up to us to you know, look deeper, spend a little bit more time. Now, I know we're all busy, and we have, we have a caseload. We only have a limited time with each child. But you know, it's, it's, um, it's good for you, for your team, and, and, and for the children that you serve, that, that you spend that extra time to really digest and process what's going on with that kid. Yes, ma'am. Um, I work with multiple families, <clears throat> and, um, but mainly children who um, have experienced a form of some form of trauma. Mm -hmm. Um, and sometimes it's related to PTSD with a fight from parents. Mm -hmm. um, but what would you say, is there some sort of um, increase in their risk for experiencing trauma in addition to these other stressors? Yes, and we'll talk about that later too, about the vicarious trauma, secondary trauma. Can you hear me? Oh, uh, can, you, can you speak a little bit louder, ma'am? Uh, sure. Uh, I was just saying that I work with children who've experienced some form of trauma um, with military among military families. So I was just asking what um, risk, is there an increased risk for children in addition to these other stressors of moving, is there also um, an increased risk for experiencing some sort of uh, trauma? And I said absolutely. And you know, we'll, we'll talk more about secondary trauma which is actually a DSM diagnosis, um, secondary PTSD, and then also vicarious trauma too with caregivers. 